today what where 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 are you going to eat today where are you going to eat today that's that's what I want to talk about where are you going to eat today thank you mr Van Armstead, for reading our scripture uh, mark chapter number 14. And reread that, if you will, beloved, in your Bible reading time, Mark chapter 14, verses 12 through 25. It gives us the background for this preachment today. Um, uh, where are you going to eat today? <clears throat> um, I asked us to be this morning. Uh, from time to time on Sundays, we might go out to eat. And I thought perhaps that this might be one of those. And I asked her, uh, where are we eating? Uh, and she said, we're going to eat here. And she told me what's going to be on the menu. And I'm delighted. And I can look forward to, uh, uh, I'm excited uh, about the menu that awaits me right here very shortly. So the question about where, where are we going to eat? Off time is a, a daily conversation in most homes is what are we going to eat today? And that's the question that we eat to um, have sometimes a couple of times a day. What are we eating for breakfast? And, what are we eating for lunch and what's for dinner? And all of us have had, we have that conversation over and over and over again. But the question today is not what are you eating, but where, where are you eating? That's the question that's raised in this passage of scripture that Minister Vedovs said read for us today. Uh, the, the disciples came to Jesus. It was Thursday morning before Good Friday. It was during the last week of our Lord's life. It was on that Thursday of the week of passion. It was on that Thursday of our Lord's la last week on earth that his disciples come to him <clears throat> and they raise the question. They say to him, uh, uh, where do you want us to go to prepare uh, that we might eat the Passover? That's what they said. They went to Jesus and they said, Master, where do you want us to go and prepare that we might eat the Passover? That's verse number 14. That's verse number... Uh, number 12 of Mark chapter 14. Do you see that? Keep your Bibles open. They went to Jesus and they said to him, where do you want us to go and prepare that this might, that we might eat the Passover? They came to him that Thursday morning and they asked, beloved, what I call the appropriate question for the morning. They asked the question, what can we do for you today? The disciples went to Jesus and they said to him, what 
can we do for you today? Don't miss this. They went to Jesus and they said to him, what can we do for you? Uh, is that the request that we normally make of Jesus? Or is the request quite to the contrary? Instead of asking Jesus, what can we do for him? We ask him what he can do for us. But here's the question that the disciples raised and the question that every authentic disciple ought to raise to him. Yes, we want him to do some things for us, but could it be beloved that there are indeed times when he wants us to do some things for him? Is it fair that he's always the one on the giving in and, and, and we are always the ones on the receiving end. And that we're more concerned, uh, pray with me now, that we're more concerned about what, what he can do for us. Have you, have you ever run into any, 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 any people like that? That they're never ever concerned about what they can do for you, but always wanting to know what you bring to the table and what you are going to do for them. They said, they said, where well, you want us to go and prepare that you might eat the Passover. Now, beloved, this says much about the disciples. It, it, it says much about them to their everlasting glory and credit. It says much about them. What does this say? It says that they knew Jesus well enough to anticipate his next move. They, 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 they were close enough to Jesus to know what he was going to do next. This, 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 this shows how close they were to him. They knew who, what he was doing. And, and, and when you are close, when the relationship is intimate, when you know somebody well enough, uh, uh, sometimes uh, the less verbal communication is necessary because you know their next move. You know how they think. There, there are some couples who have been together long enough. And there are some relationships that are so that if you ask one person a question, the other person will answer for them because they know them so well, they are able to anticipate their next move. These are how they knew Jesus so well that they knew <clears throat> He was so faithful to his Jewishness that he would indeed observe the Passover. Now also beloved, this, this lets us know that there are times beloved that the divine, uh, 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 that God will, will wait for us to initiate an action that he wants done. I think I just said something. Yeah. There are times <clears throat> when God wants something done, but he waits for you and me to initiate it. Uh, um, can I get a witness here? There, there. So, so God does not always initiate the action. There are some things, beloved, there are some things on God's divine agenda that will be accomplished because you initiate the action. And I wonder what, in what way, <clears throat> 
has the kingdom been benefited because you initiated the action? <laughs> Am I always waiting for somebody else to take the bull by the horns to initiate the action, to, to be the one to step out, to be the one to do the work? Oh, these disciples knew him so well, they with him I said, Lord, what, what do you want us to do for you today? Can we raise the question right now to Jesus, right? Now? Lord, what do you want me to do for you today? But I've been praying about, Lord, I want you to do this for me. I, I, Lord, do this for me. Lord, Lord, bless this. And Lord, give me that. Lord, Lord, do this. Lord, do that. But Lord, mm, I, it, it, it just occurred to me now. As, as pastor talks to me right now, God, I've not considered it that way. I, I'm really concerned about everything. And, and, I, oh, and I know you, you've heard me over and over and over again talking about what I want you to do for me. But today, Lord, Lord uh, on the strength of this little sermon today, Lord, I want to raise it. Lord, what do you want me to do for you? Oh, my God. And this lets us know that their relationship with Jesus, that an authentic relationship with Jesus moves and removes selfishness. So it was not about what the disciples wanted that day. Their primary concern, their, their, their chief objective that day was to accomplish what Jesus wanted done that day. Oh my God, this is what the relationship with Jesus does. It impacts your priorities. And listen, if, 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 if the relationship with Jesus has not impacted priority, then there is no authentic relationship at all. If, 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 if there is an intimate relationship, it will impact your priorities. If you love someone, you would do for them things that you have not normally intended to do. If you love your husband, if you love your wife, if you love someone, it will impact your agenda. It will impact your priorities. It will change the way you do things that will benefit them. It, it lets us know that, that it was not about them. It was about him. So the love for the Lord, the love for the church, will impact your priorities. It, um, it'll, 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 it'll change the sequence. It, it'll change what you put first. Uh, you, you'll plan, it changes what you plan your schedule. You know, that, that anything can come up and, 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 and knock some church folk off of their church schedule. Uh, anything can come up. I mean, the least little thing can come up because there is no commitment because the relationship is not intimate. It is a superficial relationship and therefore the priorities can be manipulated. But when there is intense commitment, it impacts the priorities based upon the intimacy of the relationship. They said, Lord, what do you want us to do? Where do you want us to go and prepare that you might that we might eat the Passover? Is that to know, beloved, that the divine does not always take the initiative. The job, the job that you are supposed to do, beloved, perhaps has gone undone because you've not asked the morning question. And as I hasten uh, to my point today, I want to suggest 
that the question that these disciples raise is the question that all of us ought to raise and we ought to raise it every morning. Every morning, and we can greet, we can greet him every morning, grace and peace, Lord, <laughs> all the grace and peace, Lord. Lord, what do you want me to do for you today? That's the believer's question. And, and that's, that's the church's question. Oh, what is the main purpose of the church? And what is the main agenda of the Christian? What's the main goal of the believer? Lord, what do you want me to do? Now, the reality is, beloved, that we're pretty good at telling folk what they ought to do. And Lord, I, I'm about worn out in sitting in meetings with folk talking about what somebody ought to do. And I don't have a whole lot of patience with folk who talk about what somebody else ought to do and they ain't doing nothing. I mean, big on what other folk ought to be doing. Expert on what somebody else ought to be doing. Expert to tell you what's wrong What's wrong that somebody else need to fix? Oh, but Lord, let me sit at the table. Yeah, every Sunday church. With, 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 with somebody, every Sunday is church. With, with somebody who is going to assess the situation uh, from objective eyes, oh God. And they say, well, Lord, what is it about this thing that I can impact? How can I do it, Lord? What can I do to make things better? And I had a real revelation, beloved, in this whole notion folk walk about, we want justice, we want justice. We folk marching, talking about, we want justice, we want justice. I found out that that ain't true. Folk marching, talking about, we want justice. We want, I found that that's not altogether true. Now we want a justice, but it's a selective justice. We want justice for, others, but not justice for ourselves. Talk to me, somebody. We can see the wrong in society. We can see the wrong in others. And we want justice to deal with the wrongs in society and the wrongs in other folk. But when we say, I want justice, understand it's selective justice. If you really mean it, then you want to be treated justly yourself. And all oh, beloved, the real deal is that we don't want justice for ourselves. We want justice for everybody else, but we want mercy for ourselves. Don't get me wrong now, there are some ills in society and they have to be dealt with justly and we want justice, but oh beloved, if we want justice, we got to give justice and expect justice to be uh, meted out to us in the same very way that we wanted. Lord, what do you want me, me to do? Oh, uh, church folk, they know, they know what the pastor ought to do. They know what the leadership ought to do and they know what everybody else ought to be doing. But very seldom do you hear somebody say, Lord, what can I do for the church? Uh, when, we, when we identify a problem, the question is, what can I do to ameliorate that situation? What can I do to make it better? What can I do to have a positive impact? Uh, when I see a need, oh, well, mm -hmm. and, and there are those who come to me and, 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 and say, Pastor, uh, I want the church to give here. Uh, uh, I want the church from my mission to give here and to give that. And my question is, you come to me telling me, you want the church to give here, how much have you given there? We always want somebody else to give to places where we have not given. Oh my God, all we want somebody else to do. Hey, 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 hey. When, Jesus, when Jesus sent out 
when he sent out the the seventy, uh, he, he 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 said he sent them to places that where he would later go himself. They went to places that Jesus would later go himself. If you want Jesus to go and bless a situation, then you be the forerunner. You go and do as much as you can. Then Jesus will come in and do the rest. Lord, what do you want me to do? We have this you do agenda. You do this. You go here. You go there. You do you that. But besides the Lord, what do you want me to? Where do you want us to go and prepare? Well, he said to them, he said to them, uh, 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 go uh, go in the city. You, you see a man carrying a pot of water on his head. It's unusual because that was in that culture, that was something that the women did. He said, you, it'll, it, you, you'll see a man doing that. He, he'll, have, he'll have a pot of water on his head. He'll be carrying a pot of water. When you see him, just follow him. And when he turns here, you turn behind him. And when he gets to the house, you go in that house. And you say to me, uh, what, Jesus? You mean, look for man with a pot of water? Yes. Follow him? Yes. When he turns, you turn? Yes. Go to the house? Yes. Ask the owner of the house, uh, where is the room? Yes. Jesus, why, why don't you just give us the address? And we go straight there. Why we got to go through all this stuff? Find a man with a pot of water. Follow a man down the street. Turn here, turn there, do that. Listen. Whenever God gives, whenever God gives an instruction, it's always comforted with directions. You know, he, we have to follow the plan. We, we, we got to go to the steps. Uh, we we, we want to go right to the end. But no, he gives us the plan, some steps along the way to get where he wants us to go. We want to run right. We want to right. We want to run right to the blessing. But no, he has some steps designed to develop you so you can handle the blessing when you get there. All time, the problem is that we get the blessing before we're ready to handle it. Therefore, we don't not, we don't appreciate it, and we cannot maximize the benefit that come from it. And so, he, he said, "Go, go and ask them where where is the room." And so they did that. They 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 went and they found the room uh, prepared and furnished. And said, go, go and make ready that I might eat the supper there. So they did that. Well, to make a long story short, they prepared the room. And then the text says that in the evening, he came. He, he, he came. He came with his disciples. He came. He, he, he came. He came. If you follow his directions, do what he says, he came. And when you follow his directions, he will show up. And when he shows up, the stage is set. Here he comes, can't you see him striding through town? He's been over in the hill country all day and he makes his appearance. And they begin to eat the Passover meal. And in this Passover meal is when he institute, institutes what we, we're going to celebrate here in just a minute, the Lord's Supper. While they were eating the Passover meal, and while they were eating, he did something. The text says that while they were eating, as they were eating, in the course of their eating, during the very time that they were eating, yeah, he's now going to do something that transforms. He, he takes these ordinary morsels. He takes those 
ordinary items. During the time they were eating, uh, while they were eating, yeah, he, 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 while they were eating, he did something extraordinary. While they were eating, he did something transformational. Oh, my God, aren't you glad that we have a, a Jesus who knows how to multitask, that he can be at your house blessing you while he's at my house blessing me. And, and what he did, he took the ordinary and, and got great benefit from it. He, he took the bread uh, and he makes the bread something of himself. He took the bread, he blessed it, he broke it and he gave it to them. He said, take and eat, this is my body. And then beloved, he took the cup and he gave thanks and gave it to them and said, drink ye of it. Oh my God. And they took the bread and ate the bread and, and they drank of the cup. And I don't care what that bread was before or what that cup was before, that when he took it, it became something else. It became something else altogether different when he took it. And that's a change he does with that which is ordinary. He takes it, and when he takes it, it becomes something altogether different. Can I get a witness in this house? Can anybody testify that said, that's how it happened with me? That I was very plain and ordinary. You, you said it, Kevin Blue, so I can follow up on it. When I was doing it my own way, you know, when I, I had a pretense of the faith, you know, you know, I had faith the faith. So I was blown around by every wind, whichever way it goes. But all oh, when I allowed him to really take me, oh my, he, he will take you to make you. Now he takes you and he breaks you, but he takes you to break you, not to harm you. He takes you to break you, to make you. Hallelujah. He took the bread, he blessed it, and then he broke it, and then he used it. He takes, and it makes a difference, beloved when he takes you. I don't care what you were before. It became what he wanted to be when he took it. And if there is something beloved that you need change, ask him to take it. Is there a person that you believe you've been praying that God would change? Say, Lord, Take it. Is there a habit? Is there a desire? Is there an attitude? Is there an action? Lord, take it. And oh, Lord, when he takes it, he makes it into something altogether different, into that which he wants it to be. Now, got a little problem here with my grandma. But I want to ask a question. Have you ever been took? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I've been took. And when we, when, we, when we say we've been took, oh, man, he took me. That means they cheated me. That means they promised me something. That I paid them something for something that I didn't get. They hoodwinked me. They, oh, they, 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 they took me. Oh, but when we talk about, when you say that he took me, when we say Jesus took me, 
we're not saying that he takes you to misuse you, but he takes you to transform you and to make you better. He takes you to make you an instrument of his peace. He takes you to make you what he wants you to be. Lord, take me. Lord, take my mind. Lord, take my heart. Lord, take my life. Lord, take my ministry. Lord, take my church. Lord, take my children. Lord, take my family. Lord, take my ministry. Lord, take it. Take it to make it. Beloved, are you different since he took you? Is there a different walk or different talk? a different desire. Oh, and that is so because I have been taken. Now the ground was not right. I know taken. Oh, but he took it. It makes a difference. If you're going to take somebody to be your partner, then you need to take somebody who's been took. Could it be the mess you're in is you took somebody who ain't been took. You took the look. <laughs> you took all, let me, let me close this thing out. You just took it because you like what you saw. You like what you heard. But oh, you want to take somebody who's been taken by him. Listen, if he hasn't taken them, then you don't need to take them either. Let me say that again. Listen, listen, listen. If the Lord didn't take them, then don't you take them. Listen, I don't mean that you got to abandon them. But before you take them, listen, I found this out. That matrimony before testimony leads to alimony. Let me say this again. Matrimony before testimony leads to alimony. A -a 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 Amen. You take them to Jesus, then get Jesus to take them. Then after Jesus takes them and make them, then you can take them. I think I just said something. <laughs> Well, uh, let me let go. Let me head for my exit now. Yeah, he he. God wants. He impressed upon me that he wants a pastor who's been took. He wants a ministry that has been taken. He wants a preacher who's been took. He wants a took deacon. He wants. A taken servant, somebody who, who has been taken, he takes it and he makes it as an expression of himself. He took the bread and said, this bread is me. It's my body. Take this cup. This cup is me. It's my blood. And when he takes you, he makes you unto himself. Lord, where do you want us to eat? The where is not a place. The where is a mindset. The word is an attitude. You remember, you remember that in Genesis 3, when Adam had sinned, and God, God had, he used to come down every evening and talk to Adam, but after the sin, God came down and, and to talk with Adam, but Adam was not there. And God said to Adam, Adam, where art thou? 
I mean, this is the omniscient God who knows everything. I mean, you think that God did not know where Adam was hiding in the Garden of Eden? So when God said, Adam, where art thou? He was not talking geography or topography. He said, Adam, where are you in your relationship to me? Not where are you located geographically? Not what your physical address, not what restaurant you're going to. Where are you going to eat? I ain't talking about red lobster. I'm not talking about pizza hut. Oh my God. I'm not talking about Olive Garden. I'm not talking about a physical location. But where are you going to eat in terms of your spiritual location? They went to that place. They prepared it. It was a place where the Lord could take you. It's a place where the Lord had made everything unto himself. It was a place where the main agenda in that house was to be like him. That's the place where I want to eat. Oh, the house that I live in, one Whitehall Road, that's a physical location, but I want that to be a spiritual place. It's not the physical location. Oh my God, you can be in a plush palatial mansion. Oh, or in a cracker box lean to shanty. And uh, mm, you can be unhappy in the palace, but at peace in the shanty because it's not the physical location, but you can eat in the right place. Well, we're gonna move now into the Lord's Supper. And the question is, what are you gonna to eat today? It's gonna to eat check. Somebody's eating chicken, somebody's eating turkey, somebody's eating big beef. Somebody got some sweet potatoes and yam and corn on the cob and some collard greens. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I'm getting hungry now just talking about it. But more important today in this little message is not so much what you're going to eat, but where you're going to eat. Thank you, Al Bush. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whatsoever you eat or drink, that's the place. And the place for you to eat is a restaurant call to the glory of God. That's the name of the place. Where are you going to eat? I'm going to eat at the glory of God. That's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. It may be on Main Street. It might be on this street or that street. It's not on the street. Not about the street. Not about the location. It's where God can get the glory. It's not so much it's what I'm going to eat, but where I'm going to eat. And where I eat is in the place where God gets the glory. God bless your heart, beloved. May the Lord bless you real good. All of sin becomes short of his glory. 623 says, uh, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Romans 5, 8 says, but while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, beloved, beloved. And 1013 says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Beloved, if you will call upon the name of the Lord, you can be saved. May God bless you. Join us, beloved, on Facebook at the Beulah Baptist Church, The Beulah Experience. And this is Pastor Jesse Ward Bottoms, Jr., The Beulah Baptist Church of Poughkeepsie, New York. May the Lord bless you and may the Lord keep you is our prayer for you. <laughs>